so this will be our last mini lecture before we get into the body systems. So this is kind of an overview of the body systems and next we'll be going through the body systems individually. We'll talk today about the regions of the body and the body cavities and a little bit about homeostasis. And that's to set us up to make sense of those body systems as we go along. So when you get into the body system chapters, first off, you're going to want to pay attention to what is the function of that body system? How does that body system help the body maintain homeostasis? We'll talk about that as we go through. How does it work with the other body systems? What are the parts of that body system and how do they work? All right, let's get started. So the whole reason that we're studying this anatomy and physiology is so that you're going to be effective in your health profession. Many of you are very caring people and nurses, of course, need to be caring and kind people. We also need to know how the body works so that we don't make a mistake by accident because we only want to help people. We don't want to make a mistake and accidentally hurt them. All right. So gross anatomy occurs, refers to things that we can see easily. That would be the brain there. And then microscopic anatomy is going to require a light micrograph. So those are some terms that we can be aware of. We can also talk about regional anatomy. Some older textbooks, instead of going by body systems, would go by the region of the body. If you find an old textbook like that for um, a few bucks, it's probably worth buying. For example, you might find a lab manual that's on regional systems and it would show the shoulder and the joint and it would show the bones, the muscles, the nerves, the blood vessels that are all in that area. And we're going by system. So we'll look at the blood vessels, we'll look at the muscles, we'll look at the bones, we'll look at the nerves all separately. But sometimes um, that regional approach can be, can be useful. All right. We've already talked about the levels of biological organization. And here we're just having another look at that. And they are going, they've flipped, flipped from bottom to top. So at the lowest level, we have atoms, or I could say the smallest, smallest level. We have atoms and the parts that met the neutrons, protons, electrons that make up the atoms. Then we've got molecules. Then we have organelles and cells. Then we have tissues. We talked about tissues in this uh, chapter. Then we have organs. An example of an organ is the bladder. And it's made up of tissues and it's part of a body system in this case the urinary system and then above that level we have the organism an individual person right um, some books list species next and then population I think population is lower than species right so species would include all human beings but a population might include all the human beings that live in Nebraska or all the dogs that live in Fresno County. But we're going to be working in this book, we're working right now in tissues and, and body systems. We're going through in most of this course, we're going to be looking at body systems. And this seems to be a good way to learn things. So you'll learn the parts of the system and then how it works. And of course, keeping function Organ systems of the body. We've talked about the integumentary system. That's the skin. It's providing protection from pathogens, preventing dehydration, controlling temperature. Those are major, major functions. Also providing sensation, right? You walk out the door in the morning, you can tell how cold or hot it is. Um, providing information about the environment. What do we feel, right? A lot of functions. So most of these systems do have more than one function. Skeletal system, providing support, holding us up. Protection for the skull, protection for the heart and lungs. Storing calcium, 
producing blood cells. We forget about those. Um, and then, of course, providing for movement, providing points of attachment for the muscles. Muscular system is providing for movement, right? Allows for movement, moves the bones. It also generates heat. If we're a little bit cold, we might shiver. We might move around and generate some heat to, um, to get warm again. Nervous system is controlling the body, receiving information from the outside environment, interpreting what that means, and receiving information from the inside of us as well. The endocrine system is also controlling the body and the other body systems, but not as quickly as the nervous system. Nervous system can be pretty quick, endocrine system slightly slower. Endocrine is controlling thirst, hunger, sexual drive, growth, digestion, uh, blood sugar levels, many functions. These do interact. Nervous system and endocrine system do interact. And of course, we'll talk more about those when we get to those body systems. Cardiovascular system is about transportation. We're transporting oxygen from the lungs to the cells where it can be used in cellular respiration. It's transporting carbon dioxide from the cells to the lungs to breathe it out. It's transporting nutrients from the digestive system out to the cells to be used in cellular respiration. It's transporting uh, your ammonia and urea to the uh, liver for conversion. It's transporting the hormones that are produced in the endocrine system. It is providing for its own protection in clotting. So many, many functions of the cardiovascular system. Then we've got the lymphatic system, which can be considered either part of the immune system or part of the cardiovascular system. And that provides for interstitial fluid to drain back to the cardiovascular system and also filters out pathogens. So it's definitely involved in protection. Digestive system, its function is to break down foods and absorb nutrients, right? It's also allowing for um, feces to be stored and eliminated. And many, many organs involved in the digestive system. It's pretty interesting. Reproductive system, of course, is to perpetuate the species, make more humans. Urinary system maintains homeostasis in a number of ways. It filters the blood and it maintains the blood concentrations of a number of things. It removes excess water and it removes wastes, but it also tweaks out our concentrations of things like calcium and other electrolytes. That is a really interesting system that we'll talk about. And of course, respiratory system. The function is to exchange gases between the outside environment and the internal environment, right? So respiratory, we're bringing in oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide. And we'll learn much more about them as we go along. Body cavities. Body cavities. This can be a little confusing. A point I would like to make to you now is if you are asked an open-end question, you're going to give the most specific answer you can. For example, if I said, in what cavity is the heart located? You're going to tell me the pericardial cavity. It will be true to say that the heart is in the thoracic cavity or to say that the heart is in the ventral body cavity. But the best answer if I have a fill in the blank and say, where is the heart located? You're going to say the pericardial cavity. Anytime you have a choice, if you're thinking, well, there's two possible answers to that. Unless the question says otherwise, you give the most specific answer you can, right? If it's multiple choice and I ask you, is the heart in the thoracic cavity or is it in the cranial cavity? You're going to tell me it's in the thoracic cavity. OK, you're going to give a correct answer if it's multiple choice, but always be as specific as you can. And that applies to this class and it applies to your interview with the doctor and it applies to your um, qualifying exams and so forth. 
So first separation is dorsal. Dorsal means the back, right? Think of a dorsal fin on a porpoise or a shark is on the back. So dorsal is the back. And our other word for that is posterior. So dorsal and posterior mean the same thing. So the dorsal body cavity includes the cranial cavity, which holds the brain, and the vertebral cavity, which holds the spinal cord. All right, that's the dorsal cavity, and we've divided it further into cranial and vertebral. The ventral cavity is on our front, right? Ventral cavity is on the front, and we have divided that into thoracic, abdominal, and pelvic. This division between thoracic and abdominal is easy because that's the, where the diaphragm is. The diaphragm is the muscle that is um, helping us, that is pulling air into the respiratory system. So right there's the diaphragm, and that is the dividing line between abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic. So this is thoracic. Thoracic is further divided into the metastinum, superior metastinum right there. That's, you know, kind of around the sternum, right? So sternum, metastinum, and then we've got the pleural cavities for the lungs and pericardial cavity within the metastinum. Pericardial cavity is going to hold the heart. Pleural cavities will hold the lungs. So these are one within the other, like little nesting dolls. There's our abdominal cavity, and there is the pelvic cavity, which is not separated quite as cleanly as with the diaphragm. You definitely want to know these cavities, right? You definitely need to know these body cavities. You also want to know these different groupings of um, abdominal regions. This one's pretty easy, right upper quadrant left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. While we're looking at this, you want to get used to the idea that you are looking at the patient. So this is going to be your right side, but it's the patient's left side. So make sure that you're saying left side, right? Because this is the patient, right? Particularly when we get to chambers of the heart, their right side's over here. Their left side's over here. Sometimes when I demonstrate that in lab, I hold up a big heart model as though it were, you know, oriented the way I am to make it a little easier to explain. But remember that you're talking about the patient, not about yourself. Another way we can divide up this region of the peritoneal cavity, uh, which is part of the abdominal cavity, we've got the umbilical region, right, which is around the belly button or navel. Above that, we've got the epigastric region. Below that, we've got the hypogastric region. Remember, hypo is lower. We've got the left lumbar. Lumbar is kind of the small of the back, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the vertebrae. And right lumbar, right? And then we've got the right hypochondriac region and the left hypochondriac region. Now here at the hips, we have the left iliac region and the right iliac region. So you definitely want to know these regions and be able to identify them. Once we get to know these words, it becomes a little easier, right? When we remember that umbilical refers to the navel, that makes that one easier. Tissue membranes. This is a little confusing because these membranes are thicker than the plasma membrane. So this is a tissue membrane, not a plasma membrane. So if you if you eat meat or ever cut apart a chicken or something, you see some of these membranes. So we have two broad categories of tissue membranes. We have connective tissue, which includes the synovial membrane. So this would be found in the joints right? So the synovial membranes, connective tissue, are going to be in the joints. And then we have the epithelial membranes, which would include the mucous membranes in our nose, 
serous membranes and cutaneous membranes, of course, which would be the skin. Serous membranes are around those heart and lungs that we were looking at a minute ago. Okay, so there we are. Mucous membranes line the digestive, respiratory, urinary. Serous membranes line body cavities. Um, sometimes those are removed during surgery, and that recovery can be quite painful for the patient. When you're looking at some illustrations of dissections of rabbits or cats or fetal pigs, you can see this serous membrane over the kidneys, separating the peritoneal cavity, right, surrounding the peritoneal cavity. Cutaneous membrane, of course, is the skin, and then we have the synovial membranes in the joints. Here we have some of those serous membranes. Now, around the heart, this is a double membrane, right? So the one that's farther in is called visceral. Visceral pericardium is a membrane that's right up against the surface of the heart. And then just outside of that is the parietal pericardium. And it's really just one structure, one membrane folded in on itself. Inside this cavity is fluid. And so this sac allows for the heart to move without friction. So that fluid inside this area between these membranes allows for the heart to beat, to move a little bit without friction. And this is just an idea to, um, to help you understand it, that if we have a balloon that's not really quite full and we kind of push our hand into it, we can understand that double, double membrane. We have this around the lungs as well. And these terms visceral and parietal, we will use that same, those same terms. So visceral means farther in, parietal means more towards the surface of the body by just a tiny little bit. All right. So homeostasis. So this is showing an example of extreme heat and humans do adapt somewhat. If you live in the Central Valley of California, you know that those first warm days in April or May feel really hot. When it gets up to 90, 92, maybe in May or so, you feel hot. But think about August. If it's 90 degrees in August, you're going, yeah, that's great, it's cool. So we adapt a little bit to both heat and cold. Same with winter time. Those first cold days feel pretty chilly, uh, but if we're not heating the house very much, our bodies gradually adapt somewhat, not completely, right? There's just somewhat. So that's what they, to some degree. So there's a slight adaptation there. Our metabolism can change a little bit, particularly in the winter. All right. Now, here they're talking about Mount Everest. At the top of Mount Everest, the oxygen is low. The, in, the air is less dense, and you have to pull in more to get enough oxygen. And most people will use supplemental oxygen, right, a bottle of oxygen uh, to get to the top. The people in the populations that have lived in that area for generations are somewhat more able to to breathe at lower concentrations. There have been some slight physiological changes in those populations, and some of them can get to the top without the oxygen. Uh, but the top of Everest is considered the death zone because there's not enough oxygen to breathe in. All right. So one thing we want to think about is homeostasis, and we can think of it most of our feedback loops in the body are negative feedback loops. We can think of these somewhat similar to the thermostat in our house, right? So if it gets, if it's the summertime, it gets too hot. Let's say I've got my thermostat set at 78 degrees. And if that temperature goes up to 80, the air conditioning will come on and lower it back down to 78. So that's a negative feedback. When we've reached that temperature, then it cuts off the air condition and we wait for it to come again. In this case, we're thinking of body temperature. Now here we're using centigrade, not Fahrenheit. So 37 centigrade is body temperature. 
So let's say that the body temperature is exceeding 37 and the nerve cells in the skin and brain figure that out and that activates the sweat glands throughout the body. So we begin to sweat. And that water is then leaving the skin and that heat of evaporation is carrying some of the heat away from the body. That's why sweat works. So as maybe we get a little breeze and that sweat comes off and the body temperature lowers and we stop sweating. So in this case, the stimulus was the higher body temperature. The sensor was the nerve cells in the skin and the brain. Our control was the regulatory centers in the brain. And the effector or the thing that acts upon it is the sweat glands throughout the body. Other examples of this are control of blood sugar and control of calcium levels in the body. Most of these feedback loops are negative. One is positive and that is in the case of oxytocin and childbirth. All right, here we go. This is our positive feedback loop. All right, so the head of the baby is pushing against the cervix and that sends an impulse to the brain. The brain stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin goes through the bloodstream. Oxytocin is a hormone and that stimulates uterine contractions. So that oxytocin is telling these muscles to push harder. So they push harder. Now baby's head pushes harder on the cervix, right? And that sends more um, impulses to the brain. So this is one of the few positive feedbacks in the body, all right? And if they're inducing labor, they're going to um, use oxytocin to do that. Oxytocin is also consider, considered the bonding hormone. So that was our negative feedback. Let's consider regions of the body. Regions of the body. So cephalon or head, cephalic. So you might see these words used in slightly different ways. Um, we've got the shoulder or acromial, right? That very point of the shoulder is called acromial. This entire view is a posterior view. Posterior view, looking from the back, we could also call that dorsal. The front of us is the anterior or ventral. Cranium refers to the part of the skull that holds the brain. Facial refers to the part of the skull that makes up the face. Mental is the chin. Frontal is the forehead. Underneath that is our frontal bone. That's the frontal bone of the skull. And underneath that is the frontal lobe of the brain. So as we learn these regions, it will help us with the rest of the parts. So it might seem a little scary when you're looking at all these terms, but remember they're going to help you as you go along. For example, femur or femoral refers to the um, the front of the thigh, you've got the femur bone inside, you've got the femoral nerve, femoral arteries and veins all in that same place. Um, oral refers to the mouth, ocular refers to the eyes, otic refers to the ears, buccal refers to the cheeks, axial refers to the armpit, Brachial refers to the upper arm. Antecubital or AC refers to the front of the elbow where we often do a blood draw. So that's called antecubital or AC. Antebrachial is the forearm. Carpals are the wrists. Palmer is the palm of the hand. Right? Phalanges are the fingers. All right? This is the abdomen, thoracic region, mammillary region, patellar region is the front of the knee, 
patella is the front of the knee or patella region is the front of the knee and of course the patella bone is underneath popliteal is the back of the knee crural is the front of the thigh sura or sural is the calf on the uh, back of the lower leg and curl was the shin what did i say it's the thin shin tarsal refers to the ankle um, plantar refers to the bottom of the foot calcineal refers to the heel of course the whole leg is the lower limb the arm is the um, upper limb lumbar refers to the small of the back gluteal refers to to our bottom olecranial refers to the back of the elbow and brachial refers to that upper arm you definitely want to know these these parts and it'll make life easier as you go along directional terms all right this can be confusing as we move up that's superior so we can say that the head is superior to the thorax right the farther up it is the more superior right so we can say that the eyes are superior to the mouth we don't mean better or worse we mean farther up when a person is in anatomical position so by definition this is in anatomical position not when the person was lying down right if the person was lying down well then the nose would be superior to the back of the head but that's not how it works we can say that the nose is anterior to the occipital region right we can say that the carpals are distal to the elbow so the farther away right my fingers are distal to the elbow they're farther away from the body if we're referring to the arms and the legs that's when we use the terms distal and proximal so distal is farther away from the body proximal is closer to the body so i can say that the um, upper arm is proximal to the elbow because the upper arm is closer to the body the palm of my hand is proximal to my phalanges all right the carpals are distal to the elbow because they are farther away from the body than the elbow is follow that and make sure you can do that because it doesn't always make sense to everybody we're talking about the position of the two parts so if i said the knees are what to the ankles you would say the knees are proximal to the ankles because they're closer to the body we use superior and inferior for the head and trunk we use distal and proximal when we're talking about the arms and the legs the farther to the front something is the more anterior it is the farther to the back the more ventral or posterior it is if we're talking about the tail end we say caudal if we're talking about the head end we can say cranial we can also talk about um, deep deep is farther in superficial is farther out so that we can say our skin is superficial to our muscles we can say that our ribs are superficial to the lungs we can say the heart is deep to the ribs because it's farther in ipsolateral means the same side of the body contralateral means the opposite side of the body medial means more towards the middle lateral means more towards the side all right so sides are lateral so we can say that the shoulders are lateral to the throat we can say that the nose is medial to the ears all right they're kind of at the same level we can say that the eyes are superior to the nose the nose is inferior to the eyes all right make sure that makes sense planes of the body 
A transverse plane is going to be parallel to the floor or a desktop for a person in anatomical position, right? So um, a transverse plane could be anywhere in the body. Here it's shown kind of through the waist, but it could be, could be anywhere in the body. If it's parallel to the floor for a person in anatomical position, it's a transverse plane. A sagittal plane is going to cut the body into um, two lateral portions. Mid-sagittal specifically is down the middle, but it could be um, a sagittal that's not exactly in the middle. So sagittal is going to be right down the middle. Frontal or coronal would be, if I go back up into the wall, the frontal plane is going to divide into um, an anterior and posterior portion. Sagittal will divide into left and right portions. Transverse will divide into superior and inferior portions of the body. All right. Look at those. There are some other resources there to look at uh, too. Make sure that makes sense to you. And we'll see you soon.